We have some young men that are going <clears> to <throat> hand out some handouts if you'd like to follow along with the sermon. Uh, I don't think anyone got them, so pretty much they'll hand them out to everyone as need be. Um, I appreciate this opportunity. We're good. Thanks. I appreciate this opportunity to speak. I was kind of a little nervous about it just because being um, under the weather last week, I only had my voice back for a few days this week, but we've got water, so we're, we have that at the ready. And uh, Paul Baker said that he's ready at a moment's notice to do a 45-minute sermon if I fall over. Right? Is that what you told me? Yeah, that's what, that's what I heard at least. So we should be good with that. Um, as you can see on the screen, tonight's lesson will be called The Discouragement of Elijah. And as they're handing them out, don't worry, we're not going to go over anything that's on that sheet, so it, that won't be a problem. And I also apologize, I tried to get this as big as I could, but there may be some uh, more difficult parts to see on the screen, so I'll make sure and read them out uh, for you to be able to take care of that. Elijah was a very interesting man. He was very interesting, actually. He does not necessarily have a lot of Scripture time, meaning space in the Bible. There's not a whole lot that's actually dedicated to his work. But within that span, there are some of the greatest stories and some of the greatest examples of faith that we have in any Old Testament and New Testament character. Some interesting things about him is that he was a rugged man, wearing leather uh, clothing, as we read about in 2 Kings. Random fact, he was a very fast runner. We pick that up from the 18th chapter of 1 Kings. He was a cave dweller. We see that in chapter 19 of 1 Kings, also in chapter 17. So we see a pattern building here. And also, before, his, or as we can see in his fast, is that he was able to resist many of the effects of fasting. So if you had to have a picture, it may not actually be as this uh, artist representation of him, but he was an outdoorsy sort of guy. He was uh, a hard man, able to withstand things. Um, I, I closely relate him a lot to John the Baptizer and sort of appearance and the way he was perceived uh, by the uh, children of Israel. Bill read for us our lesson text for tonight, which comes from chapter 19 of 1 Kings. But where did we just come from? If you look over chapter 18, this is where we have the ever famous battle between Elijah and the 850 prophets of Baal. And of course, as the prophets went out there and they tried to get their, their sacrifices going, they just couldn't. They spent the better part of the day doing it. We have, you know, Elijah's sarcastic statements he threw in there. And then after he got all of his altar built, put together, he had it drenched three times, and it didn't matter that the fire consumed it completely. And then, of course, we have the slain of those prophets. And as was read for you, Jezebel threatened the life of Elijah. We see in chapter 19, verse 10, also a little bit later in the chapter, this is his discouragement. So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. What is discouragement? I'm not exactly one for pulling stuff from the dictionary and putting it up here, but I'm pulling from a few different sources, and it's kind of interesting. The most basic definition of it being discourage is to deprive someone of courage, of their bravery. Also to dissuade from a position, to be able to convince someone against something that they had um, thought or what have you. And also in general, just to show a disapproval. We also, I'm not going to get into a clinical study at all on depression, but we can see discouragement as it, as it develops into what we would call as depression. Okay? And most counselors and what have you will say that depression is marked by a threefold uh, characteristic, a feeling of worthlessness, a feeling of helplessness, and a feeling of hopelessness. Now let's look at Elijah real quick. In his complaint that we read in verse 10, it says that Israel had forsaken the law and thrown down the altars. What would that mean to us? It would mean if everyone you were around, everyone that was before you within the church decided we're not following God's law anymore. And also, we're not going to worship this way anymore. And even beyond that, going after those who spoke the truth. 
And now also he has realized that they are seeking to kill him as well. Let's put depression in the, in the idea of Elijah here. The feeling of worthlessness. We see in verse 4, I am no better than my fathers who did not accomplish what they were supposed to. A feeling of helplessness. I am alone. And hopelessness, they seek to take my life. There is no hope for me. I am going to be killed. But what we're going to look at tonight is God's solution for discouragement. And there's three areas I believe that we can see God shows in chapter 19 here how we can overcome discouragement. And they're in the physical, they are in the spiritual, and they're also in the social. So if you look at the, the big part of your worksheet there, there's four points. And we're going to break them down as follows. I can't help myself. I love alliteration. It helps me remember. I hope it helps you too. We're going to be looking at verses 5 through the first part of 8, the idea of the physical in provisions. And then there's two points that are spiritual. Verses 8b through 14 is the spiritual perspective. And then verses 15 through 17, we're going to have the spiritual purpose. And then lastly, we'll finish verses 18 through 21, the social aspect with people. Physical provisions. How many of us, when you get a little tired, you get cranky? Most of us do. Let's be honest, we do. If you get a little hungry, or hangry as you call it, you know, you get a little on edge. God made us. He realizes what we need. And I find this so interesting in this passage that after basically Elijah's like, I, I don't want to go on anymore. What did he have happen? He, took down, he went down and he took a nap. He rested his body. And then what did the angel of the Lord bring to him? Brought him food. He brought him food twice, actually, for the big undertaking he was fixing to do. And I by no means am going to get into a study of dietary needs, not at all. But I do want to bring out this verse. It's from 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Or do you not know that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you are bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, as that second statement says, says, I understand the spiritual perspective of this. The preceding verse says to flee fornication. This is talking about sins against the body. So I don't want to misconstrue this in any way, but I do bring out the point that if we take care of these bodies, we are practicing stewardship. We have been given this vessel which holds our soul temporarily. Now, would it be easier to take care of it to do God's work or not take care of it and do God's work? If you don't take care of it, well, I just can't get up in the morning to make it to services. Or I, I just don't feel like helping here, or whatever the case may be. I don't want to spend a whole lot of points on this, but it bears witness in here, I think, that it says that before Elijah could be instructed in the spiritual matters, his physical needs had to be taken care of. And we need to remember that as well. Let's get on to the spiritual side of things. Number two is the spiritual aspect of it is the perspective. Fasting and prayer. It's very small in there in verse 8, but pretty much it says that you're going to need to eat a bunch because you're fixing to have a long journey. Okay, And I know prayer is not mentioned specifically in there, but I guarantee during 40 days journey that he was fixing to have that prayer would have been involved in this. And this is a side note, and I just found this interesting, is that Mount Carmel, where the, um, you know, the great episode that we talked about happened, well, when he found out that Jezebel was going to, um, going to kill him, his distance from there to um, Beersheba, where he went in chapter 19, is about 100 miles. That's significant. And he actually went to the wilderness outside of Beersheba uh, after leaving Jezreel, what have you. But then he was told that you are now going to go to Mount Horeb. Mount Horeb is also the name of Mount Sinai. Sometime take a look at your map. If you've never looked at it before and find Mount Sinai, it's in the middle of nowhere. And from where he was, that was a 200 mile journey on foot that he was gonna make having eaten only twice before he went out on there. Very impressive when you look at that. So just wanted to throw that in there. During this time though, on his journey of fasting, we relate fasting and prayer together because this is a way that it focuses the mind on God as much as the physical body pains and what have you, this is a way that we can focus our attention on God. 
There's three little points coming from the Sermon on the Mount I think that would be really good here and could have been used in Elijah's journey. The idea that in Matthew 5.44, what does Jesus say? He says, pray for your enemies. Don't you think he would have had quite a few after all that had happened to him? And of course, it's very easy for us to pray for our friends, for our family, for our loved ones. It is difficult to pray for those people. I mean, you want to talk about an actual enemy. Nobody has wanted to kill me yet. Rig, yes, someone wanted to, but nobody has wanted to kill me yet. And that is a true enemy, isn't it? And Elijah had to go through that. But it, it teaches us an important point with that. Prayer has to be made with a sincere heart, chapter 6. And also that our prayers will be answered in Matthew 7, 7 through 8. But it may not always be answered the way we think that it will be answered. So we have to remember that as well. And that's where so much discouragement comes from, doesn't it? Discouragement really is where we think something's going to happen or we think somebody's going to do something or we're expecting a certain result. And if it doesn't happen, that's where our discouragement comes from. But as we'll look a little bit later, and moving into the next point actually, is an idea of what is God's will? What is God's will in the matter? If we look at the self-examination, the next point under here in verse 9, let me just pull up the next one. It's very interesting, the question that is asked. I love questions that God asks, because He knows the answer. So He's really just asking a question to make you as the individual think. I think a lot about Adam, how it said, where are you? He knew where he was. Where are you spiritually is what he wanted to know. So take this question that Elijah is asked. Why are you here, Elijah? Where was he? He was in a cave in the side of Mount Sinai, talking to God. Why are you here? And that is where he gives his big complaint of, of Israel and what have you. So with this, I go to the New Testament. And I look at a, a line by Jesus here in John chapter 6, verse 38, speaking about his intent to do God's will. And sometimes if we get discouraged, sometimes we have to ask the question, am I doing what God wants? Am I fighting against, against what God wants me to be doing? That might be where a great deal of discouragement is coming from that does not need to happen. That rather we need to see, am I doing the will of my Father? Now, I love this section of the story in 1 Kings. I mean, it's like early pyrotechnics. It was just amazing. Lightning, everything, boom, 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 boom. And all of these great acts of nature that God produces to pretty much, you know, get Elijah's attention. But then in verse 12, what does it say? That he spoke in a still, small voice. That's one of the most powerful things, I think, is that God can do any great, great and mighty thing he wants. But he spoke to Elijah, I believe, the second time in that still, small voice. And it takes me to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 6, a very simple verse, but I call it the, the alls of God. Because then one God of all, who is above all and in all and through all. He's everywhere. God was with Elijah on that journey. God was with Elijah all of this time. He is in full knowledge of what we need. And sometimes when we get that feeling of discouragement, we think God has left us. He's right there. He's there loving you, you know, wanting what is best for you. So we see here that a time of reflecting of God um, can be seen right there in Elijah. Now, so what do we have so far? This is the second part of the spiritual perspective, is that the physical needs have been met, the mind has been framed and set towards what it should be thinking on spiritually. Are we doing God's will? Are we on the right path? And now, what is he given He's given something to do. He's given a command. And I've found in my own life that if I get discouraged spiritually in any kind of way, I realize that I'm only dwelling on one little thing of Christian living, and it's just eating at me, and I, I just can't get past it. What made me think about something else that, am I studying God's Word? And sometimes it's like, well, maybe I'm not. Maybe I need to get deeper into the Word. And I ask you that too. If you get discouraged, let me ask you a simple question. Are you studying God's Word? Because the answers of life are found in there, aren't they? 
And that will help us. How many times, I mean, we can all talk of stories that we were down for some reason and then we read and it was like, wow, that helped me. I don't know why, but I, that, that point right there that I just read, it helps me. Something else we need to think about too if we're, if we're getting down is that how is our worship life? Are we putting everything we can into our worship life? Are we wanting to get as much out of it as possible? Remember this point that we are not the audience of worship. We are the participants. God is the receiver of our worship. When we are not framed correctly in that aspect, you will never have a good worship experience because it is God that is due that worship, not us. How's your prayer life? If you're down about things, and this, I, I, I don't mind telling you, I struggle with this point. I struggle with this point, and I realize that I need to always continually work in my prayer life. Just these first three right up here, studying, worship, prayer life. You start working on those things, you'll forget about other things. And I'm not making light of serious situations in any sort of way at all. But I am saying is that as a Christian, we have a full body of responsibilities that God has given us to do pretty much. How is our influence with others? We can read that from Matthew 5, 16. Are we lights? Are we distinct savory salt? Are we just like anybody else? Do we need to work on that? Do we need to stand out more in the world that we are a part of? Are we showing love to others? This is something I think everyone can work on. You go to 1 Corinthians, and of course, that's the chapter with love in there. And you see, how am I treating my brother? <clears throat> how am I treating my parents, my children, my grandparents, my next door neighbor? Am I showing love? Do I need to work on this more? And that'll keep you busy alone right there, trying to make sure that you show Christian love to the world around you. Are we opposing evil? There's a tough one. Not only enough do, is it for to study, but we have to oppose darkness in this world. We have to stand up, and that requires that study, that growth, and maybe coming out of a shell that we normally hide behind to be able to say, no, this is the right way. You know, this may turn into enemies later, but this is something that we are to do, and we are to not uh, shirk that responsibility. Are we controlling our tongue? Something also that I think we can always work on and improve. It's real easy to put those things out there, but like toothpaste, you cannot get it back in. It is out there. It is out there. So can we work on that? Absolutely. Are we caring for the lost? The Great Commission written there, first of all, are we reaching out to those who don't know Christ? Are we reaching out to the lost souls of this world? Can we stay busy with that? Yes, we could be busy all day long doing for that. And not just the lost out in the world, but those brothers and sisters who have fallen, Galatians 6.1 and are caught in sin, can we go help them? Yes. You want to stay busy? Just those two right there. That two right there could keep you busy all day long. Are we enduring through trials? I love this verse, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. It is, you know, when I think of steadfast, I think of this verse. You know, we, we often look at the verse, Revelation 2, 10, remain faithful until death. I really like this one. It means to simply keep going and not to stop. And these are things, just, just a few questions, and this is not the breadth of Christian living in any way, but it's some points to think about that we can get our mind, start working and say, okay, I need to work on these, and I can leave that discouragement behind, and that will help us. At the end of a Christian life, I, I've always loved this passage, and it comes from John uh, chapter 17, verses 3 and 4. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. That'd be beautiful on Epitaph, wouldn't it? Is that I have done your will, God. I have done what you wanted me to do, and I have glorified you, my life, on this earth. We can always stay busy. It's easy to get distracted with other things, but is there's always something that we can be busy with. The fourth point, the last thing is the social aspect, people. There's two social aspects in um, 1 Kings chapter 19 I want to bring out. The first is that he was part of a greater community. If you look at what it says in there, it says that there are 7,000 of a remnant of, of a faithful group. Now, is it 7,000 literal people? Maybe. 
or perhaps seven being the perfect number. Don't know for sure, but the point is, is that there were other people out there. What was his complaint? He said, there's nobody. I have nobody. Have you ever said that? Have you ever felt that? I know I have before. And the truth is, is that God had to remind them, there are people out there. There are other Christians who feel the same way you do, who have gone through what you are going through. And that is of great comfort. Uh, you know, I use the word connections, and I find that to be a really good word because we make connections with distant congregations, don't we? People that we don't see regularly. But we know that there is a work going on hundreds of miles away. We make connections with missionaries thousands of miles away. We can see of the encouraging things that happen with them and that we can support them and edify them, uplift them in the work that they do. We have connections with workers who have gone on before this. Let, let me explain this is that perhaps it is more seasoned members in the church, but even an encouragement. I know um, Brother Moffat let me borrow a book of church history you know, in the past 150 years. And to read the life of some of the early preachers in this country, fascinating what they went through. And that encourages me to keep going and want to do more. Uh, I find it very important. Through all of this, we share our experiences. We can help each other. Now also, part of the greater community is one, but also we have workers right here. Because what did Elijah need? He was told about the greater community, but he was, he was given what? He was given a friend. He was given Elisha. He needed somebody there. And so connections are made in the local congregation and, and neighboring congregations as well. And I ask a question under this point that, am I a fellow worker? If you look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 16, that's what it's talking about, is that we are fellow workers jointly, fit together. And me as an individual... Am I reaching out to my brothers and sisters? Am I wanting to help? Am I wanting to give of my time? I've realized very quickly that time is a precious commodity and you only have so much of it. How will you spend it? Will you be remembered as someone who is always gone? Or will you be remembered as someone who is always present and always there when needed? So I go back to the, the dictionary definitions of discouragement. And I turn it on myself. And I turn it on towards you as well. Do you deprive others of courage? Do you dissuade people from a position? Do you show disapproval? And I don't mean the false teaching, but do you not encourage? Remember we say edify. What does that mean to build up? What does discouragement do? It tears down. It's very easy to be um, uh, discouraging and call yourself a realist. Like, well, I'm just being realistic. Sometimes we just need that shot in that arm. We just need that boost to keep going. And can you be someone who encourages? Can you be someone who uplifts? Even if it may seem difficult, even if the odds may seem against you, are you gonna be someone who said, yes, you can do that. You can work hard. You can accomplish these things. I find this something that I need to work on, and I want to be able to help you as well uh, because the uplifting of the body, it's amazing what can be done, the works that can be accomplished if we only build each other up. I really like this verse. I didn't know where to put it, so I'm just going to conclude with it. Galatians 6, 9. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. It's almost put in there saying that you're going to grow weary. You're going to get down. But you push through. And also it says, for in due season, there will be a time coming. As I mentioned with Revelation 2.10, I mentioned this verse as well. We cannot lose heart. And you know how you don't lose heart? You have a body of believers here that we can encourage each other and not discourage, but rather build up. So tonight's lesson, I do pray that it was helpful to you. I hope it makes you think about how we can interact as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we offer an invitation to those that, however your life may be, maybe you are discouraged now. Maybe you are feeling the pains of a heavy burden. We've all been there, and we want to pray for you, and not just pray for you, but see how can we help you. We mentioned Galatians 6.1, we bear 
one another's burdens. Don't do it alone. It can crush you if you let it. And we also extend the invitation to those people who are not in Christ. And if you are not in Christ tonight, then you are bearing a burden all by yourself that you cannot bear. And rather than do that, you can come to Christ tonight. You can hear you've heard His Word. Believe on Him as your Savior. Repent of your sins. Confess Him as your Savior. And go down into the grave of baptism and come up in a newness of life. And I know one of the most precious things to see is the joy and the encouragement that is seen in a new Christian. I've had the, the pleasure to be able to see that as people come out of the water. And I've seen tears. I've seen smiles. And we need to always remember that excitement, that zeal that the new Christian has that we can carry no matter how many years we've been in the faith. Whatever your needs may be, please come forward as we stand and as we sing.